This is a tutorial for the stitch detail tool you can find in my cloth sewing toolbox available on Gumroad and Blender Market. First, everything is marked as asset, so to use the tools, you can just add it to your file path so it can be found by the asset browser. Then in your asset browser shelf, you should have all the tools included into the toolbox like this. Now here to use the tools, I would recommend to set the import method to link so that it can reference to the modifier from a single file which will make updating everything if I release new versions way easier. So now let's use this tool to add detail to this simple test geometry I quickly created. Now the first thing we need to do is to make sure that we have a proper UV unwrapped version of this mesh, which here I did with a simple UV unwrap angle based. And here the main thing to pay attention to is to make sure that we don't have any UV overlaps, which might cause issues when everything is computed. So for example, if I UV unwrap this version, then here we will have a whole region with overlap, which might cause issues if we want to add details to either of those parts. Now let's get back to the asset browser and drag in my stitch details tool. So this is applied as a modifier on the side and you shouldn't have to take a look at the geometry node, node tree. Everything is available right on the modifier tab. So now the first thing we need to do is to make a selection. This is based on edge loop selection. So we'll just select a few edge loops add this to a group called stitches, assign a weight of 1, and now we can add this as the edge selection input of this modifier. And here we can already see some stitches that are being instanced on the side. So now we can already rescale everything because stitches are made to be rather small and here my plane is around 2 by 2 meters. So I'm going to reduce it by a factor of 0.1 and here we will be able to see the effect of this first parameter which is apply scale. So this is just a way I implemented it right into the modifier, which acts the same as applying the scale with Ctrl A. So as you can see, if I disable it in and apply the scale on the object, it will just look the same as a non-uniform scale with this set to true. And this is rather useful if you import an alambic cache file from another software where the scale for it to look right in Blender might, be, might have to be set to 0 0.001 or something like this. Then another parameter which is really important is to make sure that you have selected the right UV map if you have a different one. So here, because I created the mesh inside Blender, the default UV map name is just UV map. But if your model comes from, for example, Houdini, it might just be called UV. And then here you might need to select UV again. The next parameter is UV scale. So basically this is needed because a bunch of things are computed into the UV space of the object and then projected back onto the workspace version of your object. And this mainly allows to have everything being really stable even if you have deformation. So here, for this to work right, you just need to set the scale correspondence between the UV space version of your mesh and the workspace. So for example, here, my mesh measures 20 by 20 centimeters, but in UV space, it's around one by one meter. So I can just set a scale of 20 centimeters divided by one meter. And this makes sure everything is way more uniform. If the scale will be different, so for example, if I set it to 0.5 in the UV space, here I will have to set 0.2 divided by 0.5, which is the new scale correspondence. The next parameter is solidify shell. So this is just meant to be used if you add a solidify modifier before the stitch detail modifier. So right here, I will just quickly apply it so we can see the issue it creates. Here, if I go into edit mode and see the mesh that the solidify modifier creates, I can see that the attribute I created earlier, inside of being a single line, like this, is now a full set of faces, which creates a bunch of looping edges like this that the modifiers can't work with. Because the modifier turns the edge into curves and then instances the stitches on top of this, but here the loops create a bunch of issues. And then the other issue is that with the solidify modifier, all the UVs are duplicated because the top and bottom faces have the same UV coordinates. So here the workaround I implemented into this set of tools is to create a new vertex group data. Let's call it shell. And here in the output vertex group of the solidify modifier, I can set this created vertex group to the shell attribute and make sure the same attribute is set as the solidify shell input of this tool. And this will separate the geometry inside the modifier and make sure everything is just instanced 
on the original surface of the mesh before the solidify modifier, which ensures that everything is working properly. The next parameter is called curve reverse threshold. So here I need to explain how the tool works a bit further. So earlier I said that the tool gets the vertex group selection we input and converts it to a curve. So now when Blender converts a set of vertices into a curve, the direction might not really be consistent. So one time it might go into this direction, but another time it can go the other way around. But for my tool, I need to compute a bunch of attributes which clearly depends on the general direction of the newly created curve. So for example, because this direction allows me to set where is the inside and outside of the mesh, so that we can slide everything along the inside of the mesh with other parameters. And here, this threshold value is just a really small distance by which the tool offsets the position of the curve and check if it is still outside or inside of the mesh. And depending on where it sits, it will switch or not the curve direction. And here it might be important to tweak this value if, for example, your UVs are separated into two islands because this distance may just end up on the other island instead of checking if it is still inside or outside of this original island. So this is mainly something to check if the behavior is not as expected. And now let's move on to other parameters to edit the visual aspect of the stitches. First, I'm going to skip those two to right away go to the resample unit stitch. So here, this tool creates all the stitches with a kind of unit stitch which is used under the hood. And this unit stitch is different for all those stitch types and you can create your own and add it to the custom stitch curve right here. So originally, this is quite low resolution to get nice performances and, which, and it might be enough to see the stitches from afar. But here, when we are way closer, we can right away higher this resample unit stitch parameter to, for example, 32 to get a better look at those stitches. So here, the first one is chain stitch, but we also have a saddler stitch, which here might look nicer with a narrower width. We also have an, a hand stitch, lock stitch, zigzag lock stitch, which this time is better when it is a bit wider, two-step zigzag, a two-thread chain stitch, and a cover seam stitch, which, which has three threads. Now for all those stitches, as I tweaked earlier, we can set the resample value. We can also set the stitch step size, the width of the stitch, its thickness and normal offset, and its distance to the selected edge. We also have another parameter, which is the stitch step multiplier, and its effect is better seen on the chain stitch, because for the chain stitch, each stitch needs to overlap with the previous one. So for this, because of the way it is scaled in the modifier, we need to add another value to kind of override the step size and change the scale of the stitch a bit further. And now I just increase this value a bit, and this is looking way more like a chain stitch, because everything is looping on itself. Another parameter is a snap to island border, which allows the stitch at the start to snap right to the edge. And here, as we can see again, everything is really stable with the deformation of the mesh. Now let's demo this a bit further by also adding a few more selection to the tool and, can, and it is looking really nice. The next one is really important and it is the compute mode. By default, it's set to local coordinates, which might be a bit more computationally intensive, but you can also set it to instancing. It might look the same, but in some cases, the local coordinates will be looking way better. So for example, if I set my geometry with very sharp angles, here the instancing will just instant the base unit stitch shape right onto the geometry and will not really follow the curve, because those will be instanced individually and then linked together. But the local coordinate will really try to follow everything, will really try to follow the shape, because it will just recreate everything right onto the spot, depending on the local direction of the normal of the mesh, the distance to the edge, and so on. And also, because the instancing is really simple, if, if there is too much distortion, it will not really change the shape of the stitch, while local coordinates will really try to stretch everything like the deformation of the mesh. Now let's move on to the other tabs. The next one is a really nice tab for animation settings, so let's switch to a more complex thread. Here with a simple parameter, we can really easily animate the instancing of everything, and we also have a few more parameters to set the width of the effect and the general height of it. 
so this allows to create really nice animations really really quickly with all the benefits of this tool. Next we have a panel for repeat settings. So here we just select a more simple thread so you can better see what's going on with lower width and even lower step size like this. Now in some cases it can be really nice to have several lines of stitches and instead of having to duplicate this whole, this whole modifier, I already implemented a few repeat settings which allows to offset everything like this. And this can give really nice control to everything. Finally, we have the output attributes, which are in number of three. We have the UV Sims attribute, which basically creates a custom UV map all around our stitches, which I will demo in a few moments. Then we have the stitches attribute, which is just a boolean value set to one for all the curves that were created with this tool. And the process island is also a boolean value set to one for all the mesh islands on which we created new data, whether it is the newly created UV map or the stitch data. So now let's have a look at this UV Sims data. So basically to use this data, I created a shader node tree, which is the shade shown data, but I will show it in a different tutorial. So for now, let's quickly have a look at this data. So I'm going to create a new material, add in an attribute node, and I'm going to get the UV Sims data. So as you can see, this is storing vector data, which unlike some UV maps has three components. So let's separate the X, Y, and Z components. And here, so you can see everything better, I'm just going to remove the two other selections I made after the fact. And I'm also going to remove a few of the points right here. So the stitches stop after a certain point. So here, the X component stores for each point of the mesh, the position along the length of the curve of each point. So here, so here this value is going from zero to around 0.7. The Y component is doing the same, but in the perpendicular direction to our stitches. So that means that if I combine again those two values and set this as the input vector of a noise texture, we'll be able to create a noise value which is flowing all around our selection. For example, also add a multiply vector to change the scale in some direction and efficiently get a kind of simple puckering bump map. It is also important to note that this second component is storing the distance to the edge of our selection, but it is an oriented distance. So that means that it can go into a positive value and negative value. And this is also the same for the third component on the Z value, but this is going in a direction which is perpendicular. And this value is mainly useful when we are far from our curve. So that means that if I get the Y component, which is storing direction perpendicularly along our curve and the Z direction, which is storing it tangentially and get the length of this vector, I can plug this into, for example, a color ramp to get a gradient effect, which will allow me to map the texture I created earlier. So if I set my noise texture as the A input of a mix node and the color ramp as the factor, I will effectively get my noise texture only where I want it. And this is really flowing along the edge of my mesh. As you can see right here, this has nothing to do with the original UV map, which just makes everything to the same direction. And finally, let's quickly demo how to add a custom stitch curve. So for this, let's add a new curve object, set for example to Bezier, go to edit mode and delete everything. So for this, what we need to keep in mind is that the stitch must go along the positive Y direction with the up direction along the Z axis. And besides this, we can do anything we want regarding scale placement or anything because the tool will just reset the scale and position of everything. So for example, I can make a main curve like this and we could even add a secondary one, for example, like this. And here we can check the direction of everything. If we go into the curve edit mode overlay and enable the normal, we can see that the direction of everything is properly going along the positive Y direction. With this curve, I can go back to my model and select it as a custom stitch curve. And as you can see, it has been instanced over all the meshes. Let's just remove the repeat stitches and change the parameters so we can see everything better. And we could even change this on the go. When we have a few stitches, it can compute quite efficiently.
And another thing I want to add is that because, as I said earlier, the tool works by getting and converting it into a curve, you can of course really easily select vertices right on the inside of your mesh. It will just it will work just as well. But you might have some issues if you are selecting an edge loop which is right next to the other. So for example, right here, some parts are ignored because everything is way too close to each other. This won't work in an expected way either. So make sure to have everything set up properly. And if you need, you can also add some more topology to make sure everything is just looping properly without some kind of non-manifold edge loops. So that's about it for this tool. Thank you so much for watching. If you still have any question, make sure to ask them in the comments so that I will be able to improve those tutorials in the future. And see you next time.